Good morning. I'm Jonathan Capehart, opinion writer for The Washington Post, and welcome to Washington Post Live. The coronavirus pandemic has led to an economic crisis that makes the 2008 financial crisis look relatively tame by comparison. But the contours of our current crisis present an opportunity to remake an economy that promotes inclusion, security, and growth. How do we do that on a global scale? And how do we do that for historically marginalized communities at the national and local level? Joining me now to answer those questions, the recipient of the 2018 Nobel Prize in Economics, former chief economist for the World Bank, and NYU professor Paul Romer, and also with us, Andre Perry, fellow at the Brookings Institution and the author of Know Your Price, Valuing Black Lives and Black Properties in American Black Cities. Thank you both for joining me this morning. Hey, thanks so, for having us. Great. Professor Good Roman, I mean, let me start with you. What does an equitable recovery look like? Uh, it depends on how ambitious you want to be. Uh, one form might be to say that everybody recovers uh, in the same percentage amount. Uh, a, a stronger, more ambitious form would be to say that the people who've historically been disadvantaged recover by more so that we reduce the spread between the richest and the poorest. And as we dig out of the crisis, both in the United States and across the globe, how can we begin to reform the winner-take-all system as supporters of a new inclusive capitalism suggest? Yeah. So um, winner-take-all is actually, I think, a good way to capture the nature of competition between firms in, say, the di digital services sector. I think when we think about the labor market um, and inclusion, I, I would use uh, different, different terminology. Um, I, I think one of the things to focus on is it's very important to make sure that everybody has a chance to work. And we think of work as being not just something that generates income, but something like school that, that generates skill. So the, the priorities would be reduce unemployment, get everybody back to work, uh, get people who had historically been out of the labor market back into the labor market, get them back to work, and then ideally run the economy hot the way we did in the 1990s so that there's actually competition for uh, workers and we raise wages at the bottom end of the income distribution. And, and Mr. Perry, I'm going to put the same question to you. From your vantage point and your perspective, what does an equitable recovery look like? An equitable recovery looks like, um, to me, is removing the drags of racism that limited productivity among um, marginalized communities before the pandemic. Um, in addition, inclusive, an inclusive economy looks like investing in Black people, brown people, as well as the neighborhoods they live in. For too long, um, racism has been part of the growth model um, in, in, in capitalism. And so we have got to remove the drag of racism. And, and in addition, um, we have got to figure out ways to um, invest in housing, um, education, and, 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 and labor. Um, it goes without saying that many people who are marginalized are, 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 can't benefit from a home in the same way as their rich counterparts. So um, we have got to figure out ways to invest in um, some of the mundane ways people um, accrue wealth in this country, and that's through housing, small business. Um, certainly, um, we need to invest in education, but for too long, um, we've had structures that prevented the mobility that's created in those assets. You know, Mr. Perry, I want to zero in on something in, in your book, and I'm going to say the title again, Know Your Price, Valuing Black Lives and Black Properties in American Black Cities. And in it, you write about the, quote, deliberate devaluation of black communities in the United States. Define deliberate devaluation. Yeah, I'll give you an example. One of the anchor studies in the book that 
Um, um, I talk about, it was done by myself, Jonathan Rothwell and David Harshbarger, where we looked at home prices in black majority neighborhoods where the share of the black population is greater than 50%. And we compared them to homes in white areas where the share of the black population is less than a percent. And what we found after controlling for education, crime, walkability, all those fancy Zillow metrics, what we found that homes in black neighborhoods are underpriced by 23%, about 48,000 per home. Accumulatively, that's 156 billion in lost equity. And we know that that's the money municipalities use to fund education, um, um, infrastructure, um, um, policing. Um, it's also the money that people use to lift themselves up. Now, the, now the reason why that undervaluing of a property occurs is Certainly pricing, um, appraisal industry um, has something to do with it, real estate agent behavior, lending practices. But we also need to look at the policies that deliberately led to the devaluation of black people and black communities. Uh, the Homeowners Loan Corporation in the 30s deemed um, black majority black neighborhoods unworthy of investment. And that mindset has continued throughout um, the decades to so that you see when it comes to business lending, um, um, banks are less likely to loan um, to uh, black entrepreneurs. And when we do get loans, they're at worse interest rates. And so a lot of the, the, the failures that we see in the economy were caused by racism. And I say all the time that there's nothing wrong with black people that ending racism can't solve, that we need to remove the policies that continuously extract wealth from black communities and black people. You know, Professor Romer, just listening to what Mr. Perry had to say, I'm sitting here wondering that, how do we get people on equal footing? Um, one of the ways Mr. Perry is saying is, you know, deal with deal with racism, systemic, systemic racism. But I'm wondering, if, you know, what role does the government play? Uh, is, is it government stimulus? Is it universal health care, uh, federally mandated paid sick leave? How do we correct, correct what's wrong in the economy? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, no, this is a this is a good question, because um, there, there's one approach, which is to diagnose the, the problems of which there are many and of which racism is a very important one. It's a it's a terrible legacy uh, that we still carry uh, with us. But then um, the, the other approach is to look at what are our, our tools, what are our treatment uh, methodologies that can actually make a, make a difference. And <clears throat> if you've got a way to move forward on one problem, um, then you may want to use it, even if it isn't necessarily addressing the, the most serious problem that we face. So we've got limitations in terms of constitutionally and fiscally what governments can do. Frankly, we also have a problem right now in that we have a very polarized political system. So it will be very hard to get consensus to, uh, uh, to do things which the government could do, which could lead to a more uh, inclusive society, but which uh, some people right now will, will oppose. So in that constrained uh, kind of environment, I think that work is something where there's a reasonable chance of a kind of a coalition in the center of people who will will back this. I mean, for example, if you think about something like a, a guaranteed um, income, mm -hmm. as opposed to measures which increase availability of work, increase the rewards from work, I think the ones that focus on work are much more likely to draw a kind of a stable, durable coalition in the center. So I think we should be exploring things like uh, wage subsidies uh, for uh, new workers in the market, for workers with low wages. I think we should even be considering something like a, uh, a government option, uh, like a kind of a public option, uh, analogous to what we had during the Great Depression with the Civilian Conservation Corps, because work is something on which most Americans agree, and it has these dual benefits of both income and uh, additional skill, plus the psychic benefits of uh, kind of purpose and uh, accomplishment. So I think work is the, the easiest place for us to move forward. Mr. Perry, Can what I, do you, what, yeah, go around, yeah. I want your reaction to what Professor um, uh, Romer had to say. Because I agree with um, um, Professor Romer in, 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 the, in a lot of the remedies 
My only challenge is that we shouldn't have to wait for white people to um, accept or uh, uh, or to to want to deal with racism and to deal with it. That we should not have to coddle white anxieties for as a way as a path towards remedy. And oftentimes you hear more centrists saying, hey, how can we come to the center? How can we come to, together? Well, many of the policies and practices are literally hurt, I mean, hurting, killing, robbing black communities, brown communities of wealth. And we have got to stop that. W whether or not white people are ready for more progressive actions um, um, or not. Um, and I, I do want to say that there's two, there, there's this belief in scarcity that is limiting us. I, my friend Derek, Hamil Derek Hamilton talked about this belief in scarcity. When we invest in black and brown people, we're increasing the pie. We're increasing mm -hmm. the productivity. And so we, we've got to take this approach that we need to invest in black people the same way we invested in white people in the 30s. It got us out of the depression then. It could get us out of the recession now. And so, but we, we have to be targeted. When we're talking about equity, let's hit the issues that are that are keeping the economy throttled. And that's the limits on black investments in, on, on black and brown people in this country. So, Mr. Perry, on on this point, just I, I want to get you to address sort of the partisan the partisanship piece to Professor Romer's uh, answer in it, to my last question, and that is, given everything that you just said and the partisan environment we are in now as a nation, do you think it's even possible for the incoming Biden Harris administration? to even have the conversations and present the legislation and to get it through Congress and onto his desk for his signature for the, the types of reforms you are talking about to actually become law. Yeah, I actually think it's possible. Many of the big, bold, progressive ideas, when you present them um, in places like Alabama or the Midwest, there are uh, many conservatives embrace it. I'll, I'll point to Alabama and many of the um, early child uh, care initiatives that they've taken on over, um, over the last five years, um, many people say, oh, that's a progressive idea. That's a liberal idea. We shouldn't um, fund early child care, uh, early childhood education. That, that That's something Democrats do. But Alabama embraced it. They're taking it on. When, when we put forth ideas that lead to investment, and everyone, I'm all for it. But we also have to show that that investment can go to black business owners, black brown, uh, brown business owners, and it can have the same um, multiplying of impact on the economy. When when black people, well, I, I generally do um, work on underappreciated assets, meaning if you just add water, it will grow. There mm -hmm. are many underappreciated assets in black and brown communities that we're simply not investing in. And when we do, the entire economy expands. And so again, it goes back to this idea of scarcity. And I actually think Republicans will embrace many of the, the um, progressive ideas when they see the positive impacts they can have on the entire economy. Professor Romer, I know you wanted to jump in there a second ago. Go ahead. Yeah, so I, I wanted to um, just react to um, Andre's point. Um, I think there's a useful distinction here um, between something like a, a appeasement as opposed to something like strategic coalition building. So I'm totally with uh, Andre that it's not uh, wise or you know acceptable to appease things that we think are morally wrong, to say, okay, well, we'll cut the baby in half, go halfway with you. But I think what we can do is be mindful of what strategies are likely to succeed. And, and as Andre say, says, recognize that there are more options to move forward here than we think. Sometimes we're, we're too pessimistic. Um, I, I think something like investing in childcare that can speak to um, the, every family that's struggling with trying to get two people uh, to go to work. I think there's room to, to build a coalition around this. I think this is a great example. Um, uh, you know, and, and, and along other lines of, of progress, I, I think one of the few positive things, signs that we've seen in the last year is much greater attention to this issue of uh, police brutality 
uh, often directed primarily at uh, minorities. And um, this is a problem we've been facing for decades, but um, it's, it's come to the forefront and it's a sign that people can coalesce around something like this, recognize that it's wrong. I think the federal government can do a lot to change practice, practices in police departments and get us to a situation where communities are safe, but people feel like the police are on their side. They work for them. They're not like an opposing uh, army. So by all means, find those opportunities to, to move forward. Um, but um, I think what I would counsel often is avoid direct polarizing uh, confrontation uh, because that often doesn't doesn't work. Okay, Mr. F I'm glad you said that. It's like you're reading my my mind, Professor Romer, because <laughs> Mr. Perry, one talk about a direct confrontational thing. The whole question. Of reparations. I mean, I was yeah. been listening to your to your your all your answers, and I'm nodding my head. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And one of the things here in Washington, particularly during the Democratic primary, reparations was a big question. And so I'm sitting here thinking of what kind of corrective intervention is needed to undo the cumulative effects of centuries of of racial economic injustice. Do you think reparations is the answer? And if so, please define reparations, because I think that is really the key question. What is reparations? Well, I'll put it in this context. After a few weeks of social distancing measures, you heard a business class screaming, we need relief from the federal government. Well, try being socially distanced for generations. What does relief look like? Reparations is simply to repair. And, and we need a spending package that alleviates some of the damage that was caused deliberately by policy. And so if people can appreciate that after a few weeks of the government forcing us to socially distance, to close businesses, we should also be able to appreciate when Black people were denied um, housing, or, um, housing assistance, um, business loans when we were um, isolated in terms of uh, being segregated, we should appreciate the, those impacts. And so for me, reparations looks like, for, in terms of slavery, the descendants of, of, of Americans that, who were enslaved should get a check, but it also should come in the form of, of for the other um, damages that were caused by systemic racism. So housing discrimination, I'll stay on that. We should set up funds for low wealth, not low income, low wealth individuals. Say if your grandfather didn't own a home, I, hey, you should qualify for um, some type of, um, of assistance there. So you can get a low interest loan or um, um, a down payment assistance. So we should have an education fund. I know there's a lot of talk about free college, but we should have a, um, an education fund um, for those who have been damaged by historical uh, racism. And so, but I will say reparation is not gonna come out of this uh, agreed upon mutual benefit. Um, clearly, there will be lots of white people who will say, I didn't own slaves, therefore, I, I, you know, I didn't do anything wrong. Well, the federal government did, and the federal government should pay. And so, for me, there's a path, but it's not going to be easy. This is about power. This is about mobilizing the willing to, to, to enact policy. And I actually think we're closer than we've ever been around reparations. But remove the word reparations. Let's talk about stimulus. And if folks were wanting to have stimulus after the government shut down businesses and the like, then they should.
greed. Um, greed is not good. Um, the kind of the norms about what's appropriate compensation, uh, what, what's appropriate behavior in business, these norms have eroded significantly. Economists were complicit in that. And I think we need to start talking as a nation and as intellectuals and as economists about what are the appropriate standards of, of conduct in, in society and, and take the reasonable business person who wants to do the right thing and, and protect her from the competition and behavior of the unreasonable person who wants to mislead customers, who wants to you know, abuse the system. We need to stop the system from awarding the people who are uh, abusing the system. We need the system to reward the people who are doing the right thing. And, and Mr. Perry, you've talked a lot about what the federal government can do to um, help African-Americans, Black Americans um, accrue wealth. What role does the private sector have to play? What responsibility does the private sector have in all this? No, I agree with Paul and that we really have to have a, a conversation about ethics in this country. Um, it, uh, lots of companies are, are dedicating billions of dollars to racial justice, but if each one of those companies did a roll call to see who's working poor within their own um, firm, they might see that they can do more to alleviate um, much of the wealth gap. And so, um, yes, um, companies have a responsibility to labor, um, and that should come in the form of, of proper benefits, proper pay, all of those um, things that have been exposed by this recent pandemic. And they also have a um, responsibility, again, an ethical responsibility to give back in the form of taxes. You know, I, I say all the time that, you know, there's an easier way instead of uh, paying for someone's layaway plan. All the, every Christmas, there's a celebrity that says, I'm going to pay your Walmart layaway. Well, there's an easier way to, to go about that, and that's by paying your taxes. And so we do need um, a conversation about um, tax code and tax reform um, in order to level the playing field. Remember, a hallmark of capitalism is about um, um, a fair competition. And right now, we the, the markets... Are, are, are conditioned in a way where there's it's not fair. There's not true competition. And the way you get that is by redistributing um, resources in a way that people can actually can compete. Um, Professor Romer, we have actually less than 90 seconds left, but I wanna get this question in from Mark Prince from New York. He asks, how do you incentivize the status quo to embrace any change in economic inequality if they currently benefit from that structure? Your complicated answer in less than a minute. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I think we should be uh, attentive to the mistake economists made before that we weren't uh, we weren't thinking about the effects that our words, our actions, our policies have on prevailing norms about right and wrong. And we not only pay attention to those, stop doing damage, but try and um, move norms in the direction that are pro-social, pro social, pro pro-inclusion uh, uh, that can really make this a better society. It, it's a long process, but I think it's one that, that can pay off. And, and Jonathan, I'm gonna do something selfish. I'm gonna make a plug for a book. It's not one I wrote, but it's a very good book called All We Can Be by Moskos and Butler about the success in the US Army in dealing with racism. Because racism has run through this conversation, we gotta look at success cases. And the Army's done a better job than any other institution in the United States in reducing the damage from racism, a much better job than universities where I work. And, and we need to look at those cases where we've had a success. We need to learn from it and replicate it. That's a, a good recommendation. Paul Romer and Andre Perry, who I wanna say, I almost wore the exact same outfit you are wearing right <laughs> now. <laughs> so I'm glad I, I'm glad I didn't. Um, Thank you very much for coming on. And Andre, I'm, I'm going to get your information because I want to get you on my on my podcast because there's a, a whole lot more that um, we can talk about. We are out of time. Thanks again, Paul Romer, Andre Perry, for coming on Washington Post Live today. Uh, I'm going to hand things off now to our partners at the Rockefeller Foundation to continue the discussion. Right now, Black people are dying at 2.4 
times the rate of white people from, from COVID-19. A basic research question is why? can't really sort of separate, particularly specifically as it relates to COVID-19, um, the, the viral pandemic from even the economic pandemic and the ways in which black and, and, and brown communities have suffered the brunt, you know, of job losses, of, of, of business closures, you know, of, of evictions, of, of housing insecurity. And, and so we want to really track uh, racial economic data in real time. And so I think what is it, when it comes to race, you know, racial data, but more specifically racial data showing racial inequity and disparities in the economy gives us the ability to understand where the hotspots are, where we need to invest, what, we, what policies, you know, we need to change. Hello, I'm Jean Meserve, a journalist and analyst for CTV News. One can't help but be struck by the line representing the Dow Jones Industrial Average, which is going up and up and up, and the lines at America's food banks, which are getting longer and longer and longer. Here to discuss this disparity and what to do about it, we have Dr. Rajiv Shah, who is president of the Rockefeller Foundation, and also Jason Grumet, who is CEO of the Bipartisan Policy Center. Thanks to both of you for joining us here today. Uh, Dr. Shah, let me begin with you. Has COVID focused our attention on inequality, or is it actually creating greater inequality? Uh, well, thank you. Uh, and the answer is both. Uh, very clearly, COVID is exacerbating and uh, calling out the inequality that existed in America. You know, before anyone ever got a positive test of COVID-19, 80% of American families were living paycheck to paycheck. The bottom 60% of American households effectively has have not had the kind of economic upward mobility for more than four decades. Uh, than they have come to expect and that give truth to the words, the American dream. And so in against that backdrop, we've seen COVID have absolutely disastrous consequences for so many communities. Essential workers who are the most at risk uh, have low wages and are unable to you know, make ends meet during this crisis. And yet we call them essential workers and celebrate the fact that they're willing to keep our country afloat economically and otherwise. We see that Black Americans are both two and a half times more likely to die. One in 1,000 Black Americans have died already from COVID-19, uh, and yet the racial wealth gap is, uh, is you know, Black American households have one-tenth the average wealth of a white American household. And so we see across the board that this crisis has both uh, illustrated that America is a deeply unequal country and exacerbated those inequalities. And frankly, the very strong uh, Fed Reserve actions and fiscal stimulus that we saw at, on the front end of this pandemic response has enabled uh, capital markets to remain strong. America's billionaires have uh, effectively made almost a billion dollars uh, in, in, in this year, I'm sorry, almost a trillion dollars this year in gained wealth, uh, while most of the economy has suffered tremendously. So. So this is a tough period of time for inequality. And if we don't take some bold and unique action soon, uh, we will not be able to imagine a recovery that is truly inclusive of America's working families. Jason Gourmet, the Bipartisan Policy Center, has been brainstorming some possible remedies. What are your top recommendations? Well, thanks. And it's a pleasure to be here with you and uh, my friend Raj. So I think um, Raj really did very nicely lay out this, the fragility in the economy before the pandemic. I think it is also true that it has kind of really revealed the challenges facing you know, the majority of working families in this country. And we did start to see some actual legislative progress on some issues that are really, I think, important to the country. So you know, for the first time in our nation's history, Congress enacted an emergency paid family leave program because we recognized that we didn't want sick people coming to work, right? There's nothing like a 
pandemic to help us understand that we are all in this a little bit together. You saw a significant effort to extend unemployment insurance benefits and modernize them. So it's not just that we were you know, increasing the amount, but we were also for the first time providing unemployment benefits to gig workers and folks who are in that kind of part-time economy who have up until now never been recognized in the same way as you know, full-time workers. We've also, I think, recognized that we have some critical healthcare investments that we have to make. And I think the, the public health infrastructure of the nation is something that I think Congress is focused on. And so, you know, it's a, it's a tough moment right now for American democracy, but we actually have some optimism that this Congress can shake off the bruises of this past election and actually start to govern. And they got to start now, right? A lot of the important programs that Congress passed just to help people get by expire at the end of the year. The unemployment insurance, the paid leave expires at the end of the year. So Congress has a real imperative now to do something just to bridge the gap, at least for four or five months to get the next Congress and president in a position to start to have more significant change. And so, you know, we believe democracy is a team sport and requires momentum and getting some early wins next year, I think, can be incredibly important. So beyond the immediate assistance that's needed, are there some other programs that you feel need to be passed that potentially could be passed in this very divided Washington that would help address the underlying issues? Yeah, so sure. You know, I can, I can point to some. And I think we actually, you know, we have to recognize that to have durable policy, we are going to have to force ourselves to have to actually talk across the aisle because neither party clearly has the kind of legislative mandate necessary to govern without the other. So if you look to the places where there is a history of collaboration, programs like the Earned Income Tax Credit, which have lifted millions of families and kids out of poverty, is something that has long had both Republican and Democratic support. And there are ways to make the project more and program more efficient so that the dollars go farther in the good direction. There is some significant interest around a pro- permanent paid family leave exercise. There was bipartisan legislation to provide that to federal workers. And so that's something that we think can go forward. I think everybody in government recognizes that our unemployment insurance program is kind of a mess. It's implemented by 50 different states. And so there's an effort underway to try to bring some harmony to that. And then the, the final thing I'll mention is that you know, we learned that people don't have savings. You know, as Raj said, 80% of families were living paycheck to paycheck. About half the country doesn't believe it could get its hands on $400 in an emergency without borrowing or selling something. We have to help families accumulate a little bit of wealth. The families that did fine in this pandemic were the families who could go without paychecks for a few months. And unfortunately, there are very few of us. Dr. Shaw, what are your prescriptions? Are they the same or are they different? Uh, Well, well, they're very similar, especially in the sense that uh, the Rockefeller Foundation supports innovations at the local and state level across the country. And that's where we've really seen real experimentation around what it takes to build wealth at the household level, how important it is to have a meaningful minimum wage that actually ensures that if you're an essential worker working through this pandemic, your wages reflect that and you can support your family. We see how critical it is to have the earned income tax credit and a refundable child tax credit expanded not just 10, 20, 30 percent, the usual kind of Washington dialogue, but three or 400 percent, which now becomes affordable because we know what it costs to support this economy through this crisis. And we have so much data across the nation around how innovations in those programs that make them more accessible to uh, single working adults, that make them more practical for people to draw down, that make them more frequent, the payments more frequent than once a year, how all of those innovations are correlated with helping families save, with helping families have that $400 or more for an emergency. And frankly, it's one of the best healthcare and child care programs we can have in this country in terms of outcomes for children and and uh, families. So, you know, what we do is we invest in experimentation and su- and produce the data that supports many of the conclusions uh, Jason just summarized very effectively. And it and it it I think illustrates a larger point that we know what needs to be done in this country to make a huge difference for America's working families. There's also bipartisan support for these things, particularly at the state level where we see you know, red states and blue states passing big expansions and innovations in these programs, it is now time for the federal government to pick that up and make it happen. 
Uh, Jason Cremay of President Biden, uh, President-elect Biden, I'm getting ahead of myself, um, has said that um, raising the minimum wage is a priority for him, and we've seen some states do that. Um, what are the chances of federal action on that in this Congress? So, you know, I think the chances early on in the Biden administration of a federal increase in the minimum wage are pretty slim. You know, that is one of the issues that has been long debated and kind of falls into the trenches of the two different party ideologies. And I think there's a particular emphasis uh, in the Republican Party for states to be making those decisions more than the federal government. So, you know, I think that's probably not going to be something that moves in the first six months. But there are a lot of things that can and you know, I think it's really important that the Congress and President-elect Biden get together on a couple of those issues. You know, one that we haven't talked about um, yet today is infrastructure investment. You know, one thing we have to recognize is that while it was absolutely essential to pour resources to support just the basic necessities for families, those are long-term arc of economic dynamism. And so I think when you see the Congress come back together, there's going to have to be a combination of continued investments just to help people get through the crisis. But then we got to raise our eyes up a little bit and think about what we need to do as a country for the next 50 years so that we can actually get back to, I think, the imagination that Raj shared, which is American opportunity, right? Work hard and get ahead. We all want to believe that's true. Right now in America, unfortunately, it's not. Dr. Shah, I'm wondering if you share this optimism, if you think that in this state, in Washington, um, that we actually can get things done. Does COVID potentially create an opportunity for legislative movement that we haven't seen? I do. I do. I, you know, I, I was in government uh, during the Obama administration, and I saw how uh, Republicans and Democrats came together time and again, usually at times of crises, to support our country and its foreign policy priorities, I think there is potential for that again in this moment. You know, the decisions we make right now will define whether the next decade is going to be one of inclusive growth in the American economy or greater divergence between haves and have-nots. Infrastructure investments, large-scale worker training, reinvesting in America's schools and education, and some of the economic policies we've been talking about here are the baseline investments you make to ensure that 10 years from now, we have a, an economy that's more equitable and defined by more opportunity for every American family, all colors, all states, red or blue, all communities, urban and rural. Everyone has been hit and been devastated by this pandemic. And this is now a time for us to come together. For that to happen, of course, that mindset has to permeate both uh, the Senate, the House, and the White House, and the American people should demand it. But I am optimistic because the data is there, the, the crisis is severe, and you know, frankly, if we don't meet this moment, uh, we're going to be looking at a, a decade of greater divergence, which I think will undermine uh, the quality and the uh, sense of understanding in our politics that we so desperately need to recapture. Dr. Rajiv Shah, president of the Rockefeller Foundation, and Jason Grumet, CEO of the Bipartisan Policy Center. Thank you both for joining today. Thank you, Jean. Thank you, Raj. And Thank I'm you, now Jean. turning the program back to the Washington Post. The rules in this country have been written for Wall Street, and it's going to stay that way until we force it to go the other way. If you're just tuning in, welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm Jonathan Capehart, opinion writer for The Washington Post, and it is great to have the president of the Association of Flight Attendants Union, Sarah Nelson, to cap our special program and conversation on inclusive capitalism this morning. Welcome, Ms. Nelson. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Really good to be here. 
So some have called you the most powerful labor leader in the country. Almost a year ago, you gave a speech, which we just showed a, a little snippet of it at the AFL-CIO dinner. You were, you were condemning the government shutdown, calling for a general strike. Senator Bernie Sanders credited you with ending that government shutdown following a speech you delivered at Reagan National Airport that went viral and may well have led to a handful of air traffic controllers not showing up for work. Why do you think your message resonated? Well, look, this was a humanitarian crisis. I mean, we had in the United States of America, 400,000 people who were forced to come to work for free. Uh, this was the longest government shutdown in uh, the history of our country, more than twice as long as any government shutdown before. And 2 million people were going without a paycheck. As I said, some forced to come to work for free. What we did was we took that moment to define the problem for the American public. As flight attendants, we were not out of work yet, but we were going to work in a space that was increasingly unsafe day by day. As air traffic controllers who have to be right on the job 100% of the time, were going under the stress and strain of not having a paycheck and not sure if they were not sure if they were going to be able to have a house for their children or be able to get their next meal. And so this was very serious, and we defined the problem for the public, and we said what we were willing to do about it. And what I would tell you is that that completely changed politics in the course of about 12 hours, because we took this out of a political assessment and really put it on the front lines about the people who were being affected and what the people and workers were willing to do to solve the problem. And that immediately changed politics. And all of the sudden, D.C., Capitol Hill, who had voted just the day before not to fund the government, changed and took the same exact plan and voted for it the next day. And so that that was a, a great success. Now, we're fast forward here a little more than um, well, actually, a little less than a year, a year later. And we're. You know, Capitol Hill is, you know, in the middle of gridlock unless, you know, you're a judicial nomination. But the COVID relief bill is stalled. Why hasn't that change of politics less than a year ago come into play when it comes to the COVID relief bill that is so desperately needed now? Well, look, we have been led to believe that we are a country that is deeply divided. And I have to tell you that as flight attendants, we have a very different experience. When people come to the plane of uh, to our aircraft plane door, they come generally with the spirit that we're in this together and they want a safe, uneventful flight. Oftentimes, the hardest part of our job is de-escalating some conflict by a few people who don't want to play by those rules. But it's very often passengers around them who we sort of enlist to help us calm those conflicts or at least shame people into doing the right thing. And that's really what we experienced during the government shutdown, too, is people came to those TSA lines, the place where people hate to go and are usually <laughs> angry and grousing about getting searched. Um, they were coming with kindness in their heart and asking those TSA officers what they could do to help them. And that's really the spirit of Americans. And that is what happened in March when coronavirus hit and all of a sudden aviation had a 97 percent drop off in demand. Our airports were ghost towns and everyone was was very concerned and very scared. And we knew in that moment that there had to be action taken. And in three days time, after the Senate voted down the one trillion dollar package that McConnell had put forward, that was most, mostly a corporate first package. Three days later, we had a bipartisan product that was two point two trillion dollars with workers first provisions in it. And we were a part of getting those workers first provisions because we are 80 percent unionized in the airline industry. So we put forward a plan and we had the bargaining power outside of the legislative process to negotiate with the airline industry over a package that would be workers first. We told them, listen, the public hates you. You've been given stock buybacks. You've been squeezing people into seats. You've certainly taken from us. Our pensions are gone. Our pay was down 30 to 40 percent through the bankruptcies. And you've been making wor us work longer hours for less. But if we do this in a way, if we put together a package that's workers first, we can save the airline industry too. And so we put in place a payroll support program that requir required the airlines to, uh, to do several things. One, keep everyone on the job and connected to their healthcare. 
to continue service to all of our communities that they were serving before, because even though there wasn't general demand for air travel, air travel is is important for fighting the virus. It keeps our communities connected. It delivers our mail. Right now, we need it to deliver a vaccine everywhere. Um, so it continued that. It capped executive compensation and banned stock buybacks even after the relief was in place. And all of the money had to go to providing the pay and benefits to workers. That is a template that we had hoped would be used for every other industry. But it's because of the power of our unions and workers being able to demand this that we were able to get a workers first package in that in that March CARES package. That expired on September 30th and we've been trying to get that in place ever since, but people have been distracted by this idea that you can't change politics and that we're at war. And I have to tell you, it's just not true. And today we have a group of bipartisan senators who are saying, we can't wait until we have a new president. We've got to have some relief right now. Uh, real fast, I do want to talk to you about the power of the unions, but real quickly, do you think um, that the lame duck session of Congress should should pass a pared down COVID relief bill if that's what it me if that's what it would take to get something passed and get through Mitch McConnell in the Senate and to the president's desk? Well, Jonathan, I will tell you that we need a real relief package that is well over $2 trillion, but we need relief right now. We have some funding cliffs here. We have the government funding cliff on December 11th. We have uh, unemployment for 12 million people who work in the gig economy or part-time workers who are going to lose any access to unemployment the day after Christmas. We have the eviction moratorium ending, and we need to supplement our, our economy with some relief right now. So what they're talking about is a rescue package, relief package, so that we can get to a place with a new Congress and a new president where we can talk about stimulus and recovery. Right now though, if we don't get relief to people, if we don't get at least what they're talking about today on Capitol Hill in place, mm -hmm. we are going to fall into a hill that is, or a, a ditch that is so hard to dig out of that we are going to be in a place of depression. And you're seeing it already with these red lines all across the country. So let's talk more about the power of the unions that you mentioned, because, and, and I wanna know, why have we seen a decline in union membership rates? I mean, we've got rising income inequality, stagnant incomes, uh, high student loan, uh, student debt loads, the middle class is shrinking. Strong labor unions, unions have, you know, they've helped put in protections for workers, and yet union membership is declining. Why is that? Explain that disconnect. Look, this is a huge problem for the public that union membership has declined, and it is by no accident. This has been about rewriting the rules so it's harder for workers to organize, so it's harder for workers to stay in unions. There have been bankruptcies and consolidations that have sought to get rid of unions altogether. There have been lopsided trade deals that have sent union jobs overseas um, and have really actually been a, a bigger problem. A lot of people think of that as a problem for white workers, but actually uh, people of color have experienced a far higher rate of losing jobs due to trade deals that have shipped uh, many of these jobs overseas. And now during coronavirus, what we're seeing is we don't have the kind of manufacturing that we need to keep people safe. So this is a problem across the board, and the, the rules have been really rigged against the American worker, against the ability to keep your union, against the ability to be able to organize your union, and where the unions are, uh, what the corporate elite have tried to do is tried to say that if you are in a workplace where you have a contract, you don't actually have to be a part of the union. You don't have to actually pay your fair share to have those good pay and benefits. So they have tried to diminish worker power everywhere they can. And the Trump administration put that into overdrive with many of the executive orders that uh, tried to deny a lot of the rights of workers to even join a union or be defined as having a relationship with an employer that they can hold accountable. So when it comes to creating a more inclusive economy, what has this pandemic shown us about what kind of labor we value? And, and going forward, how can we rethink protections for essential workers like airline employees? Yeah, so essential workers, um, let's just be real now. A lot of the jobs that we have often defined as being worth less are so critically important in this moment. Grocery workers, truck drivers, flight attendants, 
uh, people who are in the service industry, these gig workers who are delivering food to our homes right now, we would not be operating as a country at all. No one would be safe if we didn't have these jobs operating. Sanitation workers, mass transit workers. And so we can't just call these people essential workers and say that for a short period of time, we're going to honor them with a title. We haven't even gotten to the place of getting these people the kind of recognition with hazard pay that we should. But what we really need to do in this moment is recognize that this work is a lot more valuable to us than we have been willing to define before. And we have got to address the wage crisis in this country that has had 80% of families unable to meet any sort of emergency, unable to be able to respond for a couple months without getting a paycheck. And so this coronavirus has shown us the real problems in our economy and where we need to focus on raising wages, on giving people the power to bargain at work. This is going to address a lot of equality problems. We're not going to quite get at equity completely with that, but it's going to address a lot of equality problems with union contracts where everyone can see what each other makes and we all make the same thing. In my union, men and women make the exact same salary. And that's because. We have a union contract that defines it that way, and all workers are equal. So, Ms. Nelson, I have two two final questions for you, um, one substantive and one not so substantive. But the substantive one first, just listening to you, I can understand why some union leaders are hoping you'll go for organized labor's top job, the leader of the largest federation of unions, the AFL-CIO. Will you? <laughs> Well, I didn't know I was going to get that question, Jonathan. I think, l let me be really clear. I represent a union of 50,000 flight attendants. Half of my members are out of work or without a paycheck right now. And in the United States of America, that means that you also go without health care. This is not a problem that the rest of the world has during this pandemic. So my focus right now is on getting our members back to work on getting back in place this payroll support program that is the perfect template for every other industry. And I would like to hand that to President-elect Biden to be able to use uh, on the other side of this inauguration. And we, we need to address the needs right now. Uh, and that is my focus. I will tell you that this is the kind of focus that needs to happen with labor across the board. And uh, going forward, I am very interested in being a part of lifting up labor's voices, make, helping people understand that unions are for every working person, and uh, doing anything that I can to do that. And I think that leading the labor movement is one way that that can be done, but I am totally committed to this no matter what happens. And I'll revisit that question after we inaugurate a new president. Actually, you've now ignited a, a another question real quickly. Would you accept an appointment in the upcoming Biden-Harris administration? Uh, that would be an incredible honor to get a call like that. And we would have to have a very serious conversation because it just goes back to uh, lifting up the real necessity that we have got to organize in large numbers and build up the labor movement so that we can bring people together. I want I want to really make this last note very importantly. You know, union halls are the only place in this country where we can have conversations where people come from all different backgrounds, have all different kinds of political ideas, and we can actually bring people together and have the hard discussions. Every other organization is a self-selecting group. And that's not where we're going to build a bipartisan uh, spirit of we're in this together to be able to solve the incredible problems that we have before us. So building up unions is not only about addressing the wage crisis and addressing the crisis of healthcare in this country and addressing the climate crisis in a way that makes sure that we're putting workers first, but it's also critically important for our democracy to actually work because this is the space where people come together and understand that they can actually have a conversation who may see life a little bit different than themselves and still come to a consensus because at the end of the day, we have way more in common than anything that divides us. And here's my, my, my last question, Ms. Nelson. It's not, not terribly substantive, but I've seen you on television for 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 years now, but particularly during the coronavirus pandemic, sitting in front of that bookcase, and I've always wanted to know who is that person 
in the frame over your shoulder. Thank you so much for asking that, Jonathan. That is Paul Frischkorn. And he was a longtime flight attendant, a friend of mine, a union activist. And he was also the first flight attendant to die from coronavirus. And Paul stays there with me every single day. And the flight attendants out watching and watching all those interviews know that and know the commitment that we have to each other in this moment through Paul's memory to take care of each other, but also to demand the absolute best. He would be out there. In fact, the, the week before he died, he was in the crew rooms answering questions about benefits for flight attendants because he knew that they were going to be weighing whether or not they could retire, whether or not they could survive on unemployment, um, how they were going to get through this pandemic. And that, that uh, heart of service is uh, the heart that we all need to have now. And so we fight forward in Paul's name and in his honor. And that's why he stays there. I'm so glad I asked that question. Sarah Nelson, thank you very, very much for coming on Washington Post Live today. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. Come back tomorrow when former head of the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, Chris Krebs, He's going to be here joining my colleague David Ignatius to discuss his recent firing by President Trump and election security. And you don't want to miss it. Head over to WashingtonPostLive.com to sign up for a reminder. Once again, I'm Jonathan Capehart, opinion writer for The Washington Post. Thank you for watching Washington Post Live.